I am, it's a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Florian Dubost. Uh, he's, a, he's a machine learning engineer at the publicly, tra publicly traded company Hyperfine, Liminal Sciences, California, US, junior editor at Frontiers in Neuroscience and program committee member of workshops at MICCAI at NeurIPS. He did his postdoc at Stanford University in US and holds a PhD in machine learning from Erasmus University, Rotterdam in Netherlands, obtaining partnership with Harvard Medical School in the US. He also holds a master's degree in medical engineering from the Technical University of Munich, Germany, and another master's degree in engineering from Ecole Centrale Marseille, France. He was co-organizer of the Valdo Vascular Lesion Detection Challenge at MICCAI 2021 and top 10 contestants in the ADAM Aneurysm Detection and Segmentation Challenge at the same conference in 2020. In 2020. He developed the machine learning algorithms for brain MRI, EEG, and video recordings of hospital patients with application to small vessel disease, stroke, dementia, epilepsy, sleep, and others. Sorry for the pronunciation in this field. Uh, his methodological work focuses on segmentation, semi-supervised, weekly supervised, and self-supervised learning and neural network interpretability. He published over 30 peer-reviewed full articles in international journals and conferences, including ICLR and medical image analysis, and was the recipient of several deep learning competition awards. He is a reviewer for machine learning and computer vision conference, such as C uh, CBPR, uh, AAI and MICCAI and journals such as Nature Machine Intelligence. Florian, the floor is yours, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, so, yeah, first of all, I'm going to answer the question of uh, uh, your, your question earlier. Mm -hmm. So is the radiologist going to replace, is the AI going to replace the radiologist? Uh, no, <laughs> I mean, it's going to help them. So they will be able to make better decisions, like more oh. insights. Yeah, everything all right? Sorry to record. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's not going to replace them, just going to help them uh, to better. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to speak about explainable AI, and I'm going to give you some examples in uh, in medicine, um, mostly like in neurology. So I've made a little. So I have like six parts in the talk. The last one is a little bit bonus. Um, but yeah, like the first part, I'm going to give you some background information on neurovascular topics so that you understand better what's coming afterwards. Part two is going to be quite short because I have NDA, so I cannot tell too much, but I'll give you a little, little uh, flavor of what we are doing uh, at my company. Part three is, um, is uh, going to be going more in details about uh, some methods for explainable AI in uh, computer vision specifically. All, all what I'm going to present today is going to be computer vision. There's no like uh, NLP. Um, part four is going to be the application of that to a problem uh, in neurology. Part five is more technical again. It's, I think, part five is maybe the most technical part of the presentation about comparing different methods for uh, attention map computation, basically. And part six is about a little funny example about uh, adversarial attacks. I don't know if you guys are familiar, but we'll go through that. So. Yes, first of all, uh, no vascular background. And if you have questions, you can interrupt me. And also at the end of each of these uh, six sections, I'm going to have a little uh, 
time for questions, so you can also ask them uh, then. Okay, so I don't know how much you guys are familiar with all of this, so I guess for some of you it's going to be like some obvious stuff, but for the others, probably like you've never heard about this. So in your brain, there is blood, you know, like in all your organs, there is blood, so it works or it doesn't. And there is like a, a vascular uh, pathway, like a major blood vessels that are the same for almost everyone. And at the center of the brain, this is called the circle of will. So almost everyone has exactly these vessels. Some people, they could have, you know, two of these vessels, uh, but it's pretty rare. Uh, and then the smaller vessels, that's very depends on people. And so this circle of will is um, when you study, you know, blood flow in the brain, that's a major area of interest. Here you have some little drawing to explain. But yeah, this is basically your brain view from the bottom, you know, you look at it like that. Uh, yeah. And here are just some like real images so that you understand a bit better or you can visualize. That's like a structural MRI scan of a person. And uh, these two globes that are the eyes. And, you know, I kind of, you can compare that. It's very similar to what you see here. This part at the bottom, uh, it's the cerebellum, it's similar. And here in the middle, it's called, uh, you know, the midbrain. It's kind of the extension of the uh, like spinal cord, you know, like it just follows all your body. And um, that's where around this, you see here, there are like major blood vessels uh that are called the posterior um, making artery posterior cerebral artery so TCA. um yeah those are like very prominent vessels of the circle of waste and here it's just uh, another mri but it's a bit higher in the brain and you see um this the mid, like the midbrain, like that's a butterfly shape. Again, that's like a landmark that you are interested in when you want to look at the vasculature because it indicates like the position of the circle of waste. And so that's looking at, that was looking at structural brain MRI. It doesn't tell you like uh, you won't see the vessels there, uh, at least not directly, we'll go, come to that later. You won't see the blood flow. There is another modality that's based on uh, MR that's called uh, MR uh, angiography that shows the vessels. That's what you see here. So, you know, you can see uh, this is not from the right angle, so you don't see the circle of this very well, but it will be somewhere around here. And this is the carotid artery. Big one. Okay, so now it's the this. Um, MRA, but in the right view, and now you see the circle of wood is like much better. You know, the, the vessel, uh, like the mid range should be here because here you see the, the posterior artery, and these are like the uh, MCA, so middle cerebral artery, and here on the front you see the ACA, uh, anterior cerebral artery. Um, yeah, just for you to have some background on this. And this is nice, but it doesn't give you the blood flow. You just see where the vessels are. Maybe if you, you have some sort of thrombosis, you'll be able to look at them. If you want to see the blood flow in real time, you can use ultrasound. That's what this is here. And again, you know, like PCA, middle cerebral artery, uh, anterior cerebral artery. That's what I was explaining. You have to think that this is acquired from the uh, so the side of the brain, so, you know, like comparing to the picture I was showing earlier, it's kind of rotated. Uh, so the midbrain is actually here, like the little darker. It's difficult to see when, you, when you've not seen a lot of those images, but this is a little bit darker here, and that's where you can see the midbrain. Um, yeah. So now on the same topic, I was telling you, you know, on MRI, you don't see the vessels. 
you don't see the vessels directly, but what you can see sometimes, depending on the, you know, how many Teslas your MRI machine has, you will be able to see uh, the space around the vessels, and that's called uh, the previous cross space. So there is a space in between the vessel and your brain, and this space is filled with uh, several spinal fluids that's used basically for your immune system. And that's a little bit what you can see on this image here, you know, the blood vessel in the brain, and you see the space in between. And here's just a 3D representation. This normally like rotates, but if it's a PDF, you won't see. And this is what you can see on, uh, on an uh, MRI image. So this is T2 weighted. So you see the interstitial and several spinal fluid as white. And what you can see here is little white areas. And it looks a bit like tubular locally, but sometimes it looks more round. Um, the reason for that is because what you see is actually these perivascular spaces when they are enlarged locally. And the fact that they are enlarged, it's not like a completely normal process can be due to hypertension, to uh, atrophy. Um, that has been linked also to a problem in like, lymphatic clearance of your brain. So like all it like, creates waste. Uh, but basically that's a marker for um, cerebral vascular diseases. So when you see these perivascular spaces enlarged on this kind of MRI resolution, if you see a lot of them, it means that they're it's very likely that you have some sort of uh, cerebral uh, condition or that you will develop that in the future. Okay. Uh, that's what I just explained. You know, it's like this is related to, for example, stroke, vascular dementia, and hyperosclerosis. The trick of when you're trying to, um, you know, identify this uh, perivascular space is that it's very difficult to quantify this manually because, um, for example, if I go back to the image, you see a lot of those little white spaces, right? And some are bigger than others, but for example, what about these ones? And there's no arrow here. Like, are they also perivascular spaces? This is just noise. You, you don't really know, it's difficult. And different, different radars, they will have different threshold for how much they would be saying that this is something that should be counted on it. Um, and the method, methods that exist to do that, they are either like semi-automated, so you need to have some user input, or there's just a lot of hyperparameter tuning, so it's not very like reproducible from uh, one study to another, or it's just annotated in very few brain regions, you know, like if you want to do that across the whole brain, it's going to take much longer. And there are also just a lot of false positives going to detect some real sulci areas that in 2D could look like an enlarged perivascular space, but in fact, you know, it's just sulci. Yes. Um, so I mentioned already all of that. All of those, they are small in respect to image resolution. There can be a lot of them, like in the centrum semi oval, for example, which is the top part of the white matter, you could have more than 50. Uh, even depending on where you look at in the brain, they will have different appearance because it follows blood vessels. So if in an area of the brain vessels, they have like more, uh, you know, uh, the angle of the vessel is, is in average uh, larger, then they will have just a different appearance. Uh, it depends on the MRI modality and protocol. There are other lesions that can look similar, for example, white matter pent densities. If they are small, they could look like uh, perivascular spaces. And if you just look on T2 sequence, you won't be able to make the difference. You need to look at other sequences like T1. Um, it's not binary, like enlarged, not enlarged. It's a continuum. So you have this question of the threshold I was mentioning. And very often, like if you look at what's available in the clinic, like you, they, you won't have someone who have made a little, you know, pixel-wise annotations. It's just like some visual score that I'm going to tell you. There are like uh, maybe 30 uh, large various spaces on this image, or like the severity score. There are like 
on a scale from one to five, you know, it's a four. So you don't have this information to train models to be like, yeah, here there is a pair of square space. It's not as simple. Uh, do you guys have questions on that? No? Okay. Okay. And no question from the online audience. Okay. So now I'm just going to branch off quickly on the, this real time several blood flow monitoring that we are um, working on at my company. So we're designing this sort of uh, device that you can uh, keep on your head. So right now it's in the hospital, but you know later use cases could be also at home. And you know, the advantage that it's not invasive, you just have it here, you don't have to have any kind of uh, intervention. Um, you can wear it, like the idea is that you can wear it, you know, the whole day and it tracks automatically what needs to be measured. You don't have to have someone next to you, like making sure that it's uh, on spot or anything. So that's where a lot of machine learning comes in, you know. And uh, easy to use, so that you don't need to have like a uh, ultrasound technician to come install it. Like because we have this machine learning system that helps and do the tracking, you know, like the nurse or even later people at home, they could just throw inspection on the screen that you see in the back here, and you know they could measure it themselves. And this is not even possible right now, you know, with current uh, technologies like. If you want to do a recording of the blood flow in the patient, you need to have the technician that does it, and you just have it for a small period of time. You cannot see like over the day or over a week of that evolves. So you people like in medicine people don't know this. So there's even for research purposes, you know, into like okay, what's the evolution uh, of the blood flow after a stroke? Uh, what you know. You don't have this information. So even for research, this can like open a lot of doors. And yeah, this is the list of all the potential applications. Um, so you see stroke, bedospasm, traumatic brain injury, and they have different types, you know, as we were saying, like first off, you can do it in intensive care units, then in operating room or at home or in emergency departments. Uh, yeah, all of those that you can read here, they could benefit from uh, this type of device. So it's really uh, yeah, wide, uh, wide applications. So do you guys have any questions on that? No? Okay. Next part. Next part, I'm, I'm uh, I'm expecting more questions because it's going to be more technically uh, difficult. So you don't be shy to ask questions. <laughs> okay, so we had some talks already about this. Um, you know, you have an image, it's, you have a model that says, okay, there's a mushroom there. Uh, why, why do you think it's a mushroom or where's the mushroom? You know, like, and you have methods that will tell you Oh yeah, it's here. You have a heat map like this that's overlaid with the image here, and it's going to tell you yeah the mushroom is here, or there are two mushrooms here and there. Um, so that's the basics. We have seen talks about this. I have I have a little bit some redundant information here to what uh, Andres was saying this morning, um, but yeah, it's a bit different I think than what I explained, so it's still worth going through it. Um, there's this method that's called class activation map. You have the paper below. And basically, uh, when you train a uh, you know, deep learning model, at the end, usually in the most recent, uh, it's like a classification network, usually in the most recent network, you would have some sort of uh, global pooling layer, which means that the last feature maps of your models, they'll be mapped to a scalar value. So you, you lose the information about uh, you know where in the image you're looking at and because you want to output a image level label like is there a mushroom yes no and so why is your output yes no and you can map 
all of your feature maps like this to a single scalar value, and then you do a linear combination of those values to a connected layer, and then you have this output. That's, for example, in uh, ResNet, that's how it's done. Um, I think VGG didn't have that yet, but yeah, ResNet was one of the first widely used network to use that. And now in many, many networks, you have this. Uh, this sort of global pooling layer at the end. And the way this is done, you can do it with like maximum. So you take the maximum value of, of the feature map. Uh, you can take the average. Uh, usually those are the most common. You can have some more sophisticated methods. Uh, but yeah, so that's good. You know, it gives you the output. So you can train a model like this. And the trick here is that when you want to run it in, at inference time to produce this map below, um, if you just remove the global pooling layer, like here, and you keep the rest the same, so you keep the weights for the linear combination, but instead of doing the linear combination of the different uh, scalar values, you do a linear combination of the attention maps, then it's going to give you the, the linear combination of the different feature maps, sorry, F1, F2, Fn, it's going to give you an attention map M that's going to look like this. You know, it's not obvious when you when you like why okay, why if I keep the weights to be the same, but in practice that's what happens. And that's a very easy way to compute attention. Um, yeah. So there are a few problems with this, obviously. Um, you know, so that's what I just explained, you know, like. You could compute the map like this, WK, FK. Um, one of the few problems that it depends on your network architecture, and you can only do that at the last layer of your network. And you, know, you could say, oh, but what if I want to look at a layer in the middle? Then you cannot use that method. So a bit later, there is this method graph camp that also Andres mentioned, but didn't, it didn't go over it. Uh, just mention it at the beginning, and um, that can do that for any layer in the network. Okay. So the formula is, is almost the same here, you know, okay. instead of WK with alpha K, and the weight alpha Ks that are computed uh, like that. So you basically um, take your feature map at uh, the layer uh, K and uh, well, it's not layer K, but at the layer uh, in the middle of your network, not K. And then um, uh, you, will com you will compute to back propagate the output of your network to that feature map. Okay. And then you will do the sum, and that's going to give you the alpha. Okay. Is that clear for everyone? Okay. And so that's you can do for any layer in your network. There is another method here. I'm not going to go too much in details, uh, but this one is basically um, it's computing the attention at different levels of your network. So we feature maps at different resolution uh, with the ID to be able to compare, uh, to aggregate information at different scales. OK. So anyone has any question there? So another class of methods is what I call gradient methods. So it's not using the, the feature maps of your network to compute attention. Instead, it's propagating. Um, it's basically using the back propagation of your algorithm to see what pixel of your input image modify most uh, the output. This is very similar to what Andreas was showing this morning. Uh, I forgot the name of the method, but he went in detail about, about that. That's very similar to that. Uh, it's very similar also to what I just explained here with the grad cam. You see this term. It's basically the same, but here you stop the back creation process and the feature map that you are interested in. While well, here you go to, uh, to the beginning of your network where you have the input image I. And that works 
that works pretty well. Uh, but if you just do that like this, you're going to have some problems. You're going to have some interference patterns that are going to uh, kind of pollute your attention. Like you are going to have a little uh, local eye activations everywhere, and there's no good explanation for that. So a bit later, there's someone who proposed another method to improve that. And uh, they understood that it's actually caused by radio activation in your network. So when you do the back propagation, it's setting to zeros um, values in your, in your map that were negative in the forward path. But if you have values that are negative in, in the backward pass, you know, uh, your, your, your differences, it's, it's not going to set them to zero. That's, that's what is shown here, you know. Uh, yeah, it's going to uh, not do that. Um, this you can forget, but basically, if you do both, like setting to zeros the values that are negative in the forward pass and the backward pass, it gets rid of this interference pattern. And that's what's called guided backpropagation. Um, guided because you modify the behavior of your radio activation when you do uh, the backward pass for the computation of the attention map. Okay, that is, does anyone have a question there? Okay. Okay. Now the problems. Problems that. Um, so if you have small objects and you use this class activation map methods, you're going to have some problems because I will show you why. But you're, you're not going to be able to capture small objects well. And the other problem is that if you have a lot of instances in your object, you know, like if you just have one mushroom in the image, it would be okay to detect it. But if you start to have a lot of mushrooms, it's not as straightforward that you'll be able to detect all of them uh, as well. Maybe you it will highlight like two or three and say, yeah, there are mushrooms. What, what do you mean? But you have like smaller one, maybe you're interested in. So I'm going to illustrate that with some images. Uh, you know, the problem of uh, small objects, like if you use this class activation map methods, usually you have some sort of um, down sampling when you use a classification network, like the feature maps at the, at the end of your network, like close to your output, they are going to have a lower dimension, lower spatial dimension, uh, spatial resolution, than uh, your input image. And the deeper your network in general, the more that's true. So, you know, maybe in some cases, even you, you have like an eight by eight grid or something like that. So you should try to detect a very small object. It's not going to be good. You should be trying to delineate, you know, an object. You know, for example, here, like, okay, there is a mushroom approximately here, but what I want is maybe you know, the shape of the mushroom, not just like a dot in the middle. So that's something that you, if you just use this classification met method as is on a classification network, it won't work well. Uh, here you also see a little bit the problem I was speaking about, you know, it detects very well this mushroom and this one does detect it, but it's, the activation is much lower. Um, so for small objects, the, the greatest method, they don't have this problem because you back propagate uh, to the input image. So you have information on the pixel level of your input resolution. But um, the problem with those attention maps is that there's been several studies that show that they are biased towards silent region of your image. Uh, not all the time, but can be. So for example, like you have this paper, Abidio, 2018, that shows like, you know, uh, corn, it's, it's going to highlight the eyes of the person who's eating it. Doesn't make sense, you know. It, highlight, it highlights it just because it's something that's silent in the image. Uh, you know, here, the bird, it's like only highlighting silent regions. Uh, 
but you would want maybe the whole bird, you know. Here, the dog is also highlighting the contours a bit of this, of this box, you know. So it's difficult to, uh, you know, reduce those for detection or segmentation or anything like that. What's, there is a method that does pixel-wise predictions, and it's very good at it. And uh, you mentioned it earlier, already. It's a unit, so yeah, if anyone doesn't know, you can stop me and ask questions. But yeah, so that's, that became standard in uh, medical image analysis because in medical image analysis, the major, the top task is segmentation and that's very good at segmentation. And the problem to that is that you need you need to have voxel-wise label to optimize it. You know, you cannot just uh, have image level label. So that doesn't really solve our problem either, but it's a good direction. So what you can do and uh, what we did and what Sumik presented uh, already a little bit is this uh, idea that you can combine this classification map with this kind of architecture. So you can actually optimize this, uh, segmentation network, except that at the end is the having uh, one by one by one uh, convolutional layer for 3D data. This is 3D data. Uh, you will just have a global pooling. Here I have GNP for global max pooling. And the idea is exactly the same. Just combine both methods so you can optimize that on the, uh, with image level labels. And then at test times, you don't need your pixel-wise label. And at test times, you just remove that layer and you'll be able to make prediction the pixel level at the resolution of your input image without having done something. That's why it helps you to get rid of this small object problem. Um, so the second problem I was mentioning is that you, have, you can have multiple instances of the target object. And usually the classification network, they just tell you, yeah, do you have the object present? Yes, no. So, you know, I was telling you for a large pair of square spaces, you can have a lot. You don't even know sometimes, you know, like if you should count some. So it's really, really challenging, you know, and you want to be able to detect like as many as possible that you think are above that threshold. Um, and also, you know, like, so in our studies, that's what I was saying, like people, they give you, okay, there are like 50, 35, and you don't know where they are. And in our scenario, we don't want to give a prior to our network of like what it looks like, you know, you just give the number to the network and you should figure out what, what it is we are speaking about and should figure out where it is and should tell us where it is, you know. So we want to do all of that, but the only thing we have is the number, uh, like a number for one image. Um, so the idea that you can use here to leverage that number information is to use um, a regression mean squared error loss function. So instead of having, uh, you know, like a sigmoid or logistic, uh, logistic regression uh, for your model or softmax or whatever at the end as activation, you remove that, you don't have activation and you do, um, you do a regression of, of the counts. And we did some little experiments with that. So for example, here we have two grids. I don't know if you see that little white line in the middle. The first grid, so we're interested in the number of occurrences of the digit four, okay? And the first grid, we don't have any digit four. And the second grid, we have seven uh, digits four, like circle in green. And now we compare the first column is uh, with a classification network. The second column is a regression network. And you see that basically there are many, like much fewer false positive with the regression network. Third column is the uh, For in that specific case, when you have the seven occurrences, there are no strong difference. You could argue actually though that you see this one here as like, um, pretty low activation, but it's higher in that image. So, you know, if you compare that to the mushroom example, well, one of the mushrooms kind of detected, but with much low activation, it's a bit the same that's happening here, but with the regression uh, loss, it 
it's not like that it's, it's good you know it's what we want and you know we did all of that for different methods different attention map methods a d c d f so those are like just um you know labels for like dread cam cam or uh, gate backprop, uh, gate extension, and so on. And, and these are uh, FAUC. So it's the AUC under the FRC curve. So FRC curve is basically that on the uh, X axis, instead of having uh, the number of false positives divided by the number of negatives, just the number of false positive, because if you do that for a class, for data set that's very imbalanced, you, it's going to bias your results uh, optimistically. So what we do is just we keep the number of false positives and then we, we integrate over like the maximum that we set. So that's much better if you want to compare data set for this imbalance. And in light blue, it's the, the method regression. And in dark, in like uh, violet, it's the method with classification loss. And we do that for each digit. Each plot is a different digit. And yes, yeah, so the higher, the higher the FAUC is, the better, right? And you see that it's basically better almost in all cases. There is a bad case where it's not true. But yeah, for, for different methods, for different cases, it's like significantly statistically significantly better, like almost all the time. You have this case, you have that case, and that case where it's equal, but otherwise, and always with method C, otherwise it's always better. Any questions on that? Okay. So now I'm just going to show some results of that approach on the periscope space quantification that I was mentioning earlier. So this is just a reminder, okay, periscope space around blood vessels, you see it when it's enlarged on two wave images. This is the different challenges, I'm not going to repeat it. Um, yeah, so this is just some little experimental settings to give you an idea of, you know, what's the size of our data sets, uh, the age of our population, scanner is 1.5 Tesla, voxel resolution 0.5 by 0.5 by 0.3 millimeter, so it's actually quite good. Uh, how we split our sets between training the left arm test set for evaluation. What I was telling you, we, like our labels is the number of lesions. That's what we call visual scores. And for that, for the sake of that experiment, so at the beginning, we only had those visual scores. You know, our question was like, okay, how can we use those to train the model? That's the method I just presented. But then you still need, you know, if you want to evaluate well, like all your uh, methods working, you need to have some sort of, way to measure all your attention maps uh, are actually targeting what you are expecting. And the best way to do that in our case is to kind of turn that into a weekly supervised detection problem. So we asked um, some uh, MD to go through the images and put little dot annotation at the center of each of these periosteal spaces. And we did that in the big data set of like 1000 scans. And then we are able you know, to, to compute uh, the detection of our maps and match that with the detect the, the point wise label. So we didn't actually use those for training, but we use that for evaluation, and then we can actually give like some very strong quantitative results to one set of the methods working and two compare different attention map computation methods. Uh, yeah, the exact architecture is in the backup slide. I can show you later if you want. Oops. We use the MSC loss function, optimizer is at the delta, 
I like this optimizer because you don't really have to tune the learning rate that much. So usually it just works out of the bat. You just have to be patient with the optimization. And of course, we do some data augmentation, annotation, translation, everything. And those are some results in um, different brain regions. So here's the hippocampi. Um, it is a region that's kind of in the middle of your brain. It's around like more or less around the midbrain that I was showing earlier. And here it's very subtle, but there are some uh, perivascular spaces here. Sometimes you need know, to be able to see those. The radiologists they also change a bit the window leveling of the image so that they can see more contrast. Uh, but you see, you can compare different methods. You know, uh, this is just based on intensities. And yeah, so you see here, we don't see as much like the interference pattern I was speaking about without doing the gain verification. Yeah, it's not a great example. So you, you see it's a bit more already. You know, like you see that getting back prop is even further than this red method. Like it does detect a lot of weird things here that's not happening here. Yeah, here are the results that are they are pretty similar. See some uh, not false positives here. The beige ganglia, so that's the part that's uh, higher in your brain. Also in the middle. Yeah, okay. The interference pattern you see it very well in red here. You see there are like a lot of detections everywhere, and it doesn't really correspond to anything real in the image. And the gate back prop, you this this is much less of a problem. And this is the central semiovol, which is like the largest region. And what's very interesting here is that you see in red, that's what the rate are labeled as um, enlarged periodical spaces, okay? And, and you see like, for example, in our method, it's detecting like a lot of periodical spaces on the side, right? It's not just our method that's doing that. It's also like basically all the methods that are detecting a lot of periodical spaces in this area. And you're like, okay, is this, you know, just a base of, of the method that we're using, or is it, or is it some missing annotations? And uh, it is actually some missing annotations. You have, I'm going to show you a slide after that, where we'll do that quantitatively. But yeah, you could, you know, look at the agreement between different attention magnification methods, and for the cases that are prevalent in all methods, it's a strong signal that this case could be a false negative for the manual labels. Here are some quantitative results. Um, these are the you know FRC curves I was speaking about earlier. You know, we cut the false positive here at uh, 15. And you can have an idea of all the different methods compared to the hippocampi and central semi oval. Um, yeah, and below there are some, uh, so each, each method is a different color, and below you have some, uh, you know, some um, results of this uh, FAUC, so it gives you like a more global uh, idea. You don't have to pick a threshold on that curve. And usually the method that pop out the most is this GPUNet method. Dreadcam is working relatively well, actually, here. And get it back prop, depending on the region. So for that one, it is worse. But if you look at the midbrain, for example, uh, that actually works pretty well, too. So that's what I was saying about, you know, speaking about, like, we made someone review the false positives from our methods and ask them whether they are like 
actually peripheral spaces or it's just something else like weight matter density or it's just noise trying to understand you know what what was what um, we have a paper of detailed analysis on that but it's actually not online yet but yes you can see here that basically um, in the hippocampi 63 percent of uh, this candidate peripheral species identified by the neural network, they are rated as actual peripheral spaces. And so those, they are uh, cases that were basically identified by the rater, but not by the network. Only like 34% of them after like review were actually peripheral spaces. So in that case, the network's actually better. And if you look at the central semi overall, it's about the same. So, you know, although there are like some cases of mismatch between the original uh, control annotations, like you could even argue that the network is doing almost better in some cases than uh, the human radar. And yeah, you wouldn't be able to assess that at all if you didn't have this method that gives you the location of the periscope spaces. It would just give you a count. It would just tell you there are like 25, but you don't know where they are. You don't know if it's correct. You know, like the fact that you can compute these attention maps, it allows you to do like to just you know, be more explainable. If you show that to MDs, they are going to be like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, and it can even you can even like you know derive some more information. You cannot do like regional burden quantification. You can say, oh, in this sub part of the, the frontal part of the white matter, uh, there is an FGR load of peripheral spaces than elsewhere. And if you do that over a population, maybe you could you could find some association between regional burden of your lesions and the condition like uh, dementia, stroke, or whatever you know. And with just the global score, you wouldn't be able to do that. So this method is not just for interpretability and explainability and trust, but you can also derive it to do more powerful thing that, than what your origin label didn't have, you know. So this is going beyond, you know, like it's it's almost uh, unsupervised learning in a way. Yeah, so for me, I think it's really cool that, you know, just give an image like this, you say like 10, and the network can figure out that what are various spaces and detect them like better than human. And now I've, I've spoken about detection, you know, but you, you like you, as scientists, we always want to take it one little step further, right? So I tell you, you can do regional burden estimates, but maybe you say, ah, oh, no, me, I want to know the shape of the sparse spaces individually. I want to compute some uh, shape features. I want to see like the integral volume or whatever, because I'm interested in all this is associated with different uh, pathologies. I don't, like the burden is not enough information for me. I want to look further. And with this right now, yeah. Okay, confused standards. Yeah, it's just going to say that with the current method, I, as I showed, you cannot do that, but yeah. Okay, I have a, a no technical question, but when you show, if you show this kind of results with domain experts, what is the reaction? They are like uh, impressed. Okay, impressed yes. positively yeah, or positively. negatively, yeah. so not trusting you. <laughs> not trusting, <laughs> it's like too good. <laughs> okay. yeah. Exactly. exactly. That's, that's where that, the question comes, that, yeah. that uh, yeah. they are scared that they will be. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, they are, they are impressed. And because you show them that it's highlighting the periscular spaces, you know, they don't have, what, what do you want them to say? You know, it's like, no, you did that on Photoshop. <laughs> That's the only thing they could say, you know, but like, yeah, it's detecting what they think it should detect. So they're impressed, but they don't have any way to you know, say that it's not doing what it should. Do yeah. you know how they use multiple raters? Yeah. Just for like the sake of, I might've missed something or yeah, validate yeah, yeah. my results. So do you have to show multiple of these methods kind of detecting the same thing to validate your own findings so that they can be convinced because they already are using some form of validation? Okay, so that's that's a good question. So 
So usually when you show them different methods, they get confused. So my my <laughs> advice is Not show them <laughs> one method. You tell them that's that's <laughs> what it is. Because if you start showing them different method, they start questioning it more, but they don't have the technical background to understand the different subtleties. So if you start doing that, it's going to instigate more, instigate more doubts. It's not going to help you. Pick one method that you think is working best and show that. That's my advice as a computer scientist. Okay. Yeah. So just I mean, I think that is also quite uh, hard to make them understand even one model because of their, I mean, they don't have the background. So even if you try to explain <laughs> from my experience, right. it's very hard to even explain them one model. Then if you want to talk about some other, right. then they would be really- No, I understand. I just think visually, if you're showing multiple methods, showing the same results, Oh, the same results. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not saying like showing how different methods work. Just that the results are the same from all these other methods. You know, yeah. that, the the figures, the six figures that are showing the same perivascular spaces. Yeah, they, yeah, they have very similar outcomes. And I think if I was a neurologist, because like I I work with a neurologist and he always asks me have you tried this method or like, how do I know what this is the ground truth? And when I show the same thing three different ways and they still come to the same outcome, they're like, he's like, okay, so there's something there. Let's investigate this more. <laughs> yeah, so that's true. That's what I was saying, right? Yeah, they also say same thing. Right, so. right. So do you have to show all of these together to convince them or one picture is enough? No, I, again, so I, I'm sticking when I said I would just show one picture, although I, it would it could have my case. Like if it's a computer scientist, I would I would definitely show them everything. But if it's an MD, I would just show one because they are going to look for what's different, you know? Mm -hmm. Like they are going to look at this thing. Oh yeah, but look uh, here, you have some and here there is nothing. Right. So what does it mean, you know? Yeah. Is, does it mean I cannot trust uh, any of those? You know, like it's, it's they are going to try to seek you know what's uh, you know the question and if you it's nice if you do research you know to ask yourself the questions but if you just want to try to have an empty adopt it it's going to work against you yeah maybe it would be better to show them a uh, different subject and the result of different subjects mm -hmm. than different sub results from different model maybe if you take there are five subjects from the same model and you are showing five different images, giving them proper results, then maybe when in that, when my case, that is more easier to make them understand that I'm getting, there are 10 patients and I have nine patients with the same kind of results, which I'm looking for. Right. And then they are more convinced. But if I have two different models giving two different, similar, very similar for us, but maybe a bit of different for them, then they will question that. They definitely will. Right. And they say, okay, in this one, this portion is clear, but in this one, this is not, then right. then that's kind of means I hope that's what you want to do. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Defin yeah definitely. So and even better, like so showing several subjects always helps, and especially subjects that are different. So for example, they want to see one subject that almost doesn't have pairs per spaces, and they want to see that the method doesn't detect any figure. A subject that has a middle load of pairs to spaces, you know, and then a subject that has a lot and see, because that's very difficult for them when there are lots. They need to spend a lot of time annotating everything. So, you know, if you can show that in all of these three cases, it works really well, then they will be like, oh, wow, I want to do this, you know, let me use this. I need mm. this, you know, they'll be like uh, harassing you for it. The good way. <laughs> um, yeah. So, and you know, hold on to your horses because next part of the presentation will be to discuss those more like differences between methods. That's next, next uh, section, okay? So is that clear? Okay. Yeah. yeah, so I was saying uh, it's nice. Uh, also, yeah, I uh, wanted to add something to your question is that so it, I wouldn't say that that's the most perfect part of the method, but also like there's this thing in the attention map 
that it's not, so this is both a good thing and a bad thing. It's not a binary map, right? It's a heat map. So for each pixel of the image, you're going to have a value that's going to tell you how much this is actually like a periscope space, basically, how much that contributes to the network or whatever, right? So you could see that as a confidence measure almost in like how much the network is sure that this instance is the object you're looking for. So, you know, like for object for periscope spaces that are, you know, at the limit, you don't really know if you should count it or not, then you'll expect the method to have detect that in the attention map, but have a lower intensity value there, right? The ones that are very bright, they should have high intensity value. So if you start showing a map to MDs where periscope spaces are like, on well, the limit, they have very high intensity value. And on the contrary, periscope spaces that are obvious, but that low intensity value, they would question it. And, and that's sometimes tricky because something I didn't explain, it's more in the technical details of like periscope spaces, but these periscope spaces, they can be very enlarged. And when it's too enlarged, it's not classified as periscope spaces, it's classified as something else. But um, and MDs would still think of it as periscope spaces, but with our model, it's not detected as periscope spaces when it's too large, just because it doesn't correspond to the distribution we're looking for. And it ma makes sense, like clinically. But it's MDs that are still going to question. So yeah, there is a lot on that topic. So now, our set of that question, OK, it's nice, yeah? Yeah, I don't know if it fits my question there or not, but in glioblastoma detection, I mean, there are some cases in our, our clinic that there is, uh, means after, how to say it, resecting or something like that, again, there are uh, tumor coming up next, maybe ne not in the same place, but in a closer place or some yeah. other place. But it, can we also use something like this for that detection? Like if in future, there is a possibility of to try to predict the location of yeah. future tumor. Yeah. Um, or... Yeah, I mean, you could, so you could think of, it's, it's tricky, I think. I, I don't think I can say, I can answer in general, but I think what I would do is that you have some sort of longitudinal data mm -hmm. for, the, for different patients. So you can see, you know, you can try to make your network learn whether there's going to be some signal before the, the, the lesion appears. Like maybe there is some sort of pattern in the neighboring region. Maybe the tissue there has a different intensity information that is difficult to see visually, but that the network can. So I think it's, I think it's, it's changing, but I think it's worth looking into. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, what I think what you want to do is in doing that for each email longitudinally mm -hmm. and then aggregate the data, but then do like a voxel wise analysis. Uh, you would optimize your network like on the voxel wise. Because if you don't optimize your network voxel wise, it's going to be difficult to capture that information. It's so it's so subtle, you know. So in general, you have to think like, you know. The more you optimize things end to end, uh, the less supervision there is, and the more you want your signal to be strong to be able to learn something. So it's always something that you have to balance, right? Here is pretty interesting because the signal is not that strong, but we're still able to supervise it with a very loose label. Uh, but I think each time you start a new problem, that's a little bit of a bet you're going to try to make. And my advice is start with the labels you have, mm -hmm. see if you can optimize your model with that. If that doesn't work, uh, ask for more labels or better try to do some sort of active learning pipeline where you can do this kind of method. Mm -hmm. It's going to highlight some things maybe that are working, some are not, and then you can integrate that, use those early detection and have very minimal user intervention to create like a nice innovation. Like if you want to strive for performance, I think that's the best approach.
Okay, so yeah, the, the other part of the the answer is that it's nice that you have this, you know, uh, heat map that's not just binary, like saying pairs square space, no pairs square space. But if you want to compute some features about shape uh, of individual instances, it's not enough. You need to have some sort of segmentation that's telling you this is inside the particular space, this is outside. I want to know, you know, like more than just the location. Um, and, and you can actually, you know, improve the method a bit further to do that. So that's what I'm showing here. I don't have too much technical details on that. You can, you can go back to that at the end if you want. Uh, but yeah, basically, you know, as telling you earlier, you remove the radio activation at the end to have, um, to have, um, you know, to be able to optimize the count directly. You can basically, uh, at a later optimization stage, reintroduce that radio activation and force the network to do some segmentations uh, at the feature map stage, and then use those uh, basically to, to do some segmentation. So basically it's kind of learning on its own uh, threshold. So, and that's, that's way more difficult to optimize. You have to keep some parts of your, you have to optimize it in several steps and keep some parts of the network frozen so that it doesn't completely learn to try to do something else. Uh, but it's also possible, which I think is, is pretty cool. Like, because we don't know, like to optimize this, at no point there was any information given to the network about the appearance, location, or anything. They still able to pinpoint like this, the actual like delineation of the pyroscope spaces, you know, like it's not perfect, but you can see that you can derive some shape features from it. Um, yeah, so I think that's the last slide. Oh no, there's this one, conclusion. Um, yeah, so you can combine, combine units and classification maps to have some localization at the pixel level, like from the input image resolution. If you use regression objective instead of classification objective, so MSC loss using count, it's going to be better at detection. Um, the detection of various cross spaces was at least as good as that of uh, manual detection of experts. So what you know, what you said, you like they asked different writers to to uh, do the notation, that would have been better to do the pixel wise evaluation, you know. We have some of that with like the rating of false positives, false negatives, but it would be good to do that to the full data set, but of course it's more expensive, right? Seven Tesla. So I briefly went over that at the beginning, but basically this is going more into like the MRI aspect of things. So Seven Tesla, you have much better resolution. I was telling you earlier that the previous cross spaces, you see them 1.5 Tesla when they are enlarged, uh, because it's just so big that the partial volume effect of the intensity, you know, it, you, you are going to, it's going to be bright enough for you to see. Uh, if the lesion is too small because of the partial volume effect, it's going to be blurred in the background. But with seven Tesla images, it's not. It's, the resolution is so good that you start to see a lot more of those pervascular spaces and even arguably some pervascular spaces that are not enlarged. And then making the decision, is it enlarged? Is it pathological? Yes, no, it becomes even more complicated. So although you think you have more information, it's not obvious like how to use that information better. So this is, this is still an unaddressed question in research right now. And also what I've shown here is this, all this work on enlarged pervascular spaces. You know, you could tell me, or oh, it's white spot on gray background, you know. It's like, it's not very difficult, right? If you have some things that are only defined by their shape and they have like a lot of variation in size. So for example, white matter quantities is like this, they have a lot of variation in size it can be more difficult to use this type of methods if you really want to have some sort of delineation. So you know, there's still some, some work to be done there on just more complex objects, because in the end, those are just like little tubular white structures. 
Yeah, any questions on this section? Okay. Yeah, it's first question. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask verification of the form. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the you start to challenges. One is the small object. Yeah. And another one is the number, right? The number of yeah, objects. Yeah, yeah. Right. So just find out there what kind of what is the size of the, the image and what is the location of your small object and also the number of what is the what of the, the limitation? Limitation. Yes. Yeah. So the how small you can detect and the how many numbers of objects can detect in what kind of size of image. Yeah. So we didn't like study that quantitatively in like the limits uh -huh. in this case, but I can give you some numbers. So so the images that are typically like the full MRI images, I think they're typically around like um, 200 by 200 by 90, because it's 3D, right? Yeah, okay. it's 3D. Uh -huh. So, well, now you have GPUs with more memories, so maybe that's great, and you can easily, more easily share workload across GPUs, but when I was working on this, you are very limited by the GPU memory. So, you have to kind of uh, split. You know, that's why I show the result per region. You know, like here I, I show just the basal ganglia mm -hmm. because this already like a lot of uh, voxels. So I just extract that region from the brain, crop it, and that's what I give to my model. And this is going to be something like more, uh, I think in Z is like 60 maybe. Uh, maybe 80 by 80, 80 by 80 by 60, something like that. That's the size of the image. Okay. And then on, at that resolution, the paper square spaces, they could be as small as uh, you know, two or three voxels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's at the really, when I say like voxel size, yeah, voxel it's size. voxel size. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, then the limits, the, what's the limit? So the, in terms of count, in terms of count. So you see those. This region that's the biggest and that's also the one that has the most. So I've seen, and this one is it's larger. Usually it's like the Z is smaller, so it would be uh, I think like 16, 16 voxels in Z. So it's kind of you know uh, like a kind of bridge. I want to say yeah. And the density is like huh? the system number, right? Yeah, 16 in Z. So okay. okay. It's like 192 by 192 mm -hmm. and, uh, and 16. Okay, yeah, I see. Like this, so it's like this. Okay. And in those, you can have up to like uh, easy 60 plus. Uh -huh. So, yeah, it's much more like in this small region here, usually like if you have five, it's a lot already. But in this one, you can have like 60 plus. Okay. And that's why it's the, what we do that now is that we train a network per region. You know, I was telling you there's difference. They also look different depending on the region you look at them. Yeah, so, and the distribution is so different. You know, like if you train a network to detect, you cannot use exactly the same network for both. You need to optimize them for the distribution. Yeah, it's not the range, for example. Yeah, yeah, we just re, yeah we just retrain it. In practice, what we even do, you know, staying you, it can be a bit tricky to optimize. We we first start training on the midbrain because it's easier. The region is smaller, so you, you do your you know your your passes much faster. Mm -hmm. And and the problem is simpler. It's like usually here, white is previous cross space, not white is not previous cross space because we have already a good region extraction algorithm. And they, they can't really be anything else here that's not very, that's wide in the various mm -hmm. space. It's much easier to optimize that. So we first start to optimize the network there. Mm -hmm. And there we fine tune the network on that task. And it's, you can optimize it much faster if you do it like this. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Sure. Mm -hmm. And you have a question in that section? No? So. OK. Now we. We go to the part that's like uh, public in Mark said. <laughs> this is one of the latest things I, I worked on. So I think this is a good question. <laughs> so you know that's answering the question of like 
you know, what if the attention magnet is different? You know, the injury is thick, but the frame. I mean, you saw that some are, you told some are better than others in that scenario, but, you know, can we dig a bit more there, you know? So, for example, here, uh, you know, you have some, uh, let's say the input image, you have the ground truth label, and then you have what the baseline uh, model says. Then you have the attention map, red can, and get it back creation for, for this model. And here it's saying it's a train. It's like not a train, it's, it's an airplane, right? It's a bit tricky. And then you look at the attention map, it doesn't really make any sense, right? It's just like a bit all over the place. Here it's saying it's a bird. It's, it's a bird, it's saying it's a person. Again, the attention, they don't make that much sense. We even see that they focus on the sky. So maybe, you know, like you could even say, yeah, you know, it's just wrong, it's predicting person. But maybe, it's, let's say it was predicting bird and let's say it's focusing the sky. Do you really want the model to do that? Do you want the, your model to say, oh, I see sky, so there must be a bird somewhere, you know? It's an explanation, but it's not necessarily the explanation you want, right? So it, it's some sort of bias in your model, right? It's just a, it's a shitty model, right? <laughs> you don't know that mm -hmm. unless you look at the attention map. Uh, here, you want to detect person staying trained. Here's a bit more like, you know, you could wonder what is this? This could be a train, it's more like some sort of bus or something, but you could wonder. And you see they don't agree, like the grad cam is looking at something in the background and back prop is just focusing basically on science as I was saying earlier. It's not just really like it's looking at the window, the eyes of the person. Not, this doesn't really help you in any kind of way, right? And here the gated back prop is, is better. You know, like the ground truth are there's a car and motorbike. And you know you could argue that this is better, but the localization it is not great. You know, it's telling you that there is a motorbike also on the side, waiting with everything. It's not ideal, right? And and this actually, like an observation that we had is, you know, staying in this means your model is a bit shitty, right? So it, in that case, we designed an experiment to make the model fail. Okay, we just we just these are these are images from Pascal, which is like an object detection data set. We just optimize it on the image level, so the class names. We don't use the actual bounding boxes. Just say there is an airplane in the image, and um, and then we even you know if that's that's too easy already you know so we just make the problem more difficult by reducing the number of sample per class that are available in our training set. So we'll make it just two sample per class, and then you have to generalize to the rest. That's difficult, right? Just two images of airplane, you have to generalize to the rest. It's tricky. Then you get some <laughs> shitty results like this. <laughs> okay. So, um, yeah, that doesn't work. And now you know why we put the attention map, okay? But, you know, like, what can you do about this, you know? And, you know, if you show that to a doctor, they're definitely not going to be convinced. <laughs> so, there, there is an idea that if the attention map are not consistent, it probably means that your model is doing something wrong. And if they show the same thing, if you have different attention maps, like so all the same thing, then your model is, start, you know, it's likely doing something good, like a bit in the continuation of what you're saying. So, how can you, first question, how can you measure the consistent, consistency between attention maps? Because they are pretty different, right? And second, like, what, how can you use this to make things better, okay? So this is just, you know, basically the, if you think that H is the is a function that would quantify the similarity between your attention map, and this is the expectation of our all, you know, the samples in your data set, you want to maximize that. This is just some like fancy formula to say that, okay. And now you could say, okay, I want this to be included in my optimization. So I want to be able to um, have a loss term that takes that into account. Then I can force my model to have the attention map being consistent. So if I take a little example to show that, like the example of the bird, I kind of modified it, modified it a bit so that 
it's easier to to explain. Uh, but yeah, so let's say you get grad cam like this with that formula I gave you earlier, get it by population like that same formula I gave you earlier. Now you see I changed it a bit this time. It's actually showing something that's different, right? It's like highlighting the bird, mostly the bird, a little bit of the of the tiles on the roof. But this one is pretty good actually, right? Like this is time to do it, what you want. So you know, take the model I showed you is this was just very bad here, but let's think for a second that this one is good and this one is not. You know? And then you still want to optimize the uh, similarity between these maps. Um, but you know, it's very different what, right? How do you compare those two? Like we're not we're not back into the now we, we have like a, you know ResNet model or something like that. We don't have the GPU net with like the nice voxel wise. You just want to take any model and compute different types of attention map and, and force consistency. You don't want to change the architecture, right? And you are you are end up with something like that, like okay, how am I going to be able to compare those two? Like the, the distribution of voxels is just so different. So Different scale, different spatial distribution. So here I'm going to show a method that you can use for specifically those two types of attention maps. We have a paper on that uh, that's uh, also looking to integrate gradients, for example. That's an overall type of attention map. But you could think of generalizing this ID to like overall attention map method or just attention method overall. So what we do is that once we've computed these two maps, the grad cam and gated backprop, we take the gated backprop map and we create a mask from it uh, like this. So basically this is just like binarizing the values. Uh, and this is, we didn't tune those really, so it's not super sensitive to those parameters, really just to have something that's uh, binary. And then, we use that as a mask to the input image. So you actually can take the input image and multiply it with this mask and you pass it through the network again. In reality, the mask needs to be a bit more blurry than that, but you know, like to have more of the shape. Uh, but yeah, basically you are kind of using the gate backdrop to, for, for, you know, like just exclude the information that's retained by it. Then you compute the grad cam again a second time uh, with that mask input. So it gives you another grad cam map here. Exactly following the same formula, just that the input now is masked. And now you can compare them. It's like it's more comparable, it's the same resolution, you know, uh, and you can try to force them to be different. And there are, again, there are different methods once you have those to. Uh, Force them to be different. We have an ablation study. I think it's in one of those slides, so I can show you some results on that. Uh, but yeah, one simple thing that you can do, and that worked well in our case, is that you just like vectorize those maps, right? Flatten them, and then you look at the pure sort correlation of uh, intensity values. So if I summarize the algorithm, something like that, you propagate forward propagation of X through your network, F. You compute grad cam, you compute get it back prop, you turn the get it back prop image into a mask that you five you use to mask your input. You forward propagate again the mask input, you compute the second grad cam image, and then you do the first. Then you get results that are much better like this. So for example, here, you could argue that this is not ideal because it should be focused more toward the center, but it's already much better than the beginning image. And, and we didn't use overlay, we're just forcing attention consistency. The bird, again, you know, it's, it's much better. Here, you know, if you try to detect the person, it's, it's much better than this one, the, both like grad cam and get back prop up are better. Here, um, here now it's clearly focusing on the car, you know, like here you are like focusing a little bit on everything. 
here it's much more clearly focusing on the curve and both of them. Um, of course, oh, yeah, we have quantitative results, but before that, this is some results on the normal data set that's on um, videos of epileptic patients in the hospital. And it's basically about even detection video clips. So you would have different tasks like suctioning. So you know, uh, when there's like trying to get some fluid from the baby's mouth, because this is with like babies or children, patching, so you know, on the back of the baby, tapping with the hand, rocking, sit down in some sort of chair or, or bed, you know, like making you go left, right. Chewing when they are eating, and we want to have information about all of those because it can have some influence on EEG recordings. Like it could trigger EEG recordings that are similar to what's happening in a seizure, but it's actually not a seizure. So we want to have that information to be able to make the difference. And if you use the, so we don't have that much data for this. You know, this is a real case. Like the first scenario is showing you Pascal with like a hot, you know, I made it difficult on purpose. That just for the sake of you know, the experimentation, this is actually a real case where you have trouble here. So if you use um, if you use this like baseline method, you know, like it's all over the place. Like why is it focusing the bottom here? Like what is all of this? You know, I, I don't know. It should focus somewhere, something here. You know, section, not all of that thing. Um, same, you know, pet things like uh, I don't know, like it's. A little bit focusing on the end, but you know, like as much as something in the back. Here, like the grad cam, you know, rocking, it's just completely on the side of the image, it doesn't make any sense. Here, same grad cam is detecting the side of the bed, like basically, it's detecting area where, where the sun hits, right? Like when it's lighter on the bed, it's not at all what we're interested in, it doesn't work. It's actually more. <laughs> So, and with the method, it's not perfect, but you see that most of the time it's actually like detecting something in the right area, you know, like here even actually like for the child, it's, you see it start to also detect the mouth, which is uh, interesting, like because when chewing it's detecting the end and the mouth because they are like bringing food to their mouth. So if you look at the video of that, it's, it's like really cool actually. And you know, if you show that to MDs, like this detecting chewing, this like makes so much more sense than this weird shit that's detecting the back, the side of the image. Like if you show them that, I mean, you won't even show them that, you'd be ashamed, right? Well, yeah. So, and that also, so this is nice. This is uh, qualitative, you know, uh, observation, but also helps the model like quantitatively. So for example, on Pascal, with small data sets, if you look at the F1 or mean average precision uh, for detection, you know, uh, you have significant uh, differences, especially for F1. And it's for like the small data set, it's, uh, it can be like a lot better you now. And then as you go, as you increase in, you know, data set size, you don't have, you don't observe these differences anymore because the network just learns to do that when there's more data. You know, it's learning the correct representation. You don't need to force it to do that anymore. It doesn't really add anything. It's very similar. And those are results on these uh, hospital videos. And you see that on overall, it's it's increasing the performance like a lot. Uh, so this is with fewer, the first row is with fewer sample, bottom row is with more sample. And this Sinclair method is already trying to, you know, it's not even like just a normal baseline. This is already trying to deal with this like little available data. So yeah, the real baseline is like at 50, you know, you know MF1 of 15. So it's, it's not perfect 30, but it's, it's like twice better than that. Um, yeah, and then you see that in some cases, actually, it's it's worse. So that's still, you know, it's still not perfect, it's still open for discussion, but uh, overall, it's better. I have a 
clinical question. Are yeah. these things that they look for, like these habits or behaviors that could potentially lead to a seizure? I don't know, I'm just asking. Yeah, 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 exactly. So good question. So yes, uh, everything that's kind of, um, I don't know if you have seen a seizure or an EG, but there is basically some sort of very, uh, like, it's kind of not sinusoidal, but it's periodic, periodic signal that you can see uh, very clearly. And that's all usually like neurologists, they, they can uh, see seizures on EG. And if you do anything that has a periodic movement in real life, it could be misinterpreted. So for example, patting, you know, you, it's periodic, right? Uh, eating, it's periodic. Rocking, periodic. That's that's the reasoning. Makes sense? Right. Yeah. So they're removing it. Like they're classifying it as not seizure activity. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And that's some quantification the, because on Pascal, we have the bonding boxes, right? So we can actually quantify whether we are targeting the right objects or not. We don't have that on the videos, but we have that on Pascal. And the met, like we can show quantitatively that the method is actually helping in, you know, if you're trying to do some sort of weekly surprise detection as speaking earlier, it's better when you Cost the attention map to be consistent when the data sets are small. As you increase in data set size, it doesn't matter anymore. It's the same observation. So, everything I told you qualitatively, it's backed up uh, quantitatively with statistical tests. Um, yeah, this, I'm just going to go fast. It's just a um, sort of ablation study. You know, I told you we use this um, uh, getting back patient as a mask and Pearson correlation to compare the different back uh, grad cam maps at the end. And we have a correlation of 82% between this, the attention quantity loss with that setup and uh, the target supervised loss, which would be a classification and cross entropy type of loss. So it's very correlated. This metric is very correlated with how well you can classify your objects. Okay. And we, we look at the this kind of correlation of different setups and you see the results, they, they vary a lot. So that's why we, we pick that one, you know? And yeah, you can also try to use grad camera as a mask, but it doesn't work very well. Okay. Um, so take home messages. You can use, of course, you can use CAM, grad CAM, by project unit to visualize the attention of your network. Okay, it's, I think everyone knows. Yeah. When you have poor optimization performance, those maps, they can, give, they can give you contradictory results. And it's very, you know, like, it's very difficult to explain to someone that your network's doing the right thing when each method you're using to visualize is showing something different. And it's a good reason. It's just because usually your model is not good, so you should improve your model. Um, and you, you can force them to be similar to improve the model. You can use that to, to as a regularizer. Um, yeah. Anyone has questions on that? No. Okay. So this is the little last little section. We have six minutes. Uh, but it's okay, it's, it's just a finishing. So it's not explainable AI per se, but it's more like AI and trust. You know, I don't know if you guys are familiar with adversarial attacks. No? Yes, some yes, some no. So basically adversarial attacks is that you will add a little bit of noise to your network that's, that you can't, that the person won't be able to see is going to modify the prediction of your network like dramatically. So you, for example, you could have an image of a chest X-ray and uh, you say the person has COVID and then you modify a little bit 
and then oh no, the person is healthy, so we don't need to pay for insurance. You know, mm -hmm. things like this. Like they are imagining it, they have to pay for it. Like example, a bit crazy example scenarios, but like real application. So it's just to mess up with the network to change the production, like from like not just a little bit, like predict the opposites. Okay, that's usually like what you what you see with adversarial attacks. Here, what I wanted to show is something that goes beyond that is adversarial attacks for segmentations. So you have this little different. Uh, here you have this chest X-ray, this two D chest X-ray, one to segment. Yes, shows as delineation, but in fact, it's segmentation. The lengths here, so let, let's say this one, this one is pretty good. The lengths, left, right, the clavicle, left, right, and the article. And you have these different columns, it, it's different epsilon, so meaning like, you know, you add some noise to the image, the more, this, the stronger this noise is going to be, the better you expect the attack to work, right? But the more someone will be able to see it. And then there's the difference between white box and black box. White box means that the person who's designing the attack, they have access to the network, its weight, its architecture, everything. Black box means that they don't know what the network looks like at all. Okay. And you have a continuum in between those, they could have access to some of the information, but not all. Okay. So what you see here is basically like the more the more noise you introduce, like the stronger the noise, the easier it is to just mess up everything. Here, this here the goal for that experiment was just to make the network fail as much as possible in the segmentation. Okay? It's not to to try to make it detect something else or predict something. Just trying to make it mess up. And so it's working best when you have strong epsilon. And it's working better for white box and black box. And I was saying here, if you have a white box and small epsilon, it's it almost doesn't work. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Uh, I think I missed it, Minzi. You want to say if we have more noise, is this the network is able to make the segmentation better? Like no, if you have more adversarial noise, yeah. so like it's not actual noise. It's, yeah. Okay, so it's, it's like artificially you are producing some noise. Yeah, it's noise designed to mess up the network. Okay. So and what if the data is already very noisy? Like the real. So it's different. So there's there's the noise in your acquisition protocol mm -hmm. or whatever. That's mm -hmm. one thing. Mm -hmm. You can expect uh, if you train your network, like if you have enough data, you train your network some regularization, you can expect the network to be mm -hmm. re like resistant to that. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, you could have some noise in your in prod that's a bit different than what you saw in your training set, but it won't, maybe it will make the network fail, but it's not the purpose of the noise, right? It's just here, like, you don't, nobody controls it, right? This noise is a, it's a mean noise. This is like noise in, like designed to make you fail. It's not random. It's, it's, it's designed to be almost not visible and to make you fail. It's bad noise. Worse noise than that. Okay. It's like I want you to not have your PhD with this noise. Put it in your, in your script somewhere, you know? <laughs> this kind of noise, okay? <laughs> okay, so that's the part that's funny. Because you know, I told you you can you can design the noise to make the network just do nonsense. But you can also, and I told you you can design to make it predict the opposite. You know, like on the image level basis, but you can also optimize it to make it do funny things. So now instead of you know, the art, it doesn't, it looks like in reality, it's like some sort of oval shape, right? But you can create some adversarial noise. And yes, that's the image with the noise and the output. So you, you see, you don't see anything, right? And now the network believes it's a little, uh, it's a little hard, you know, like a, the shape of a, like emoji heart, you know? So, and this, of course, it, the network never saw that in real data. There, no one has a heart like this, right? So that doesn't exist in reality. You know, like you could say, when you do adversarial noise to go from healthy to not healthy, you, know, you could say, oh yeah, not healthy is something possible. Like you've seen that in your data set. So it's not completely crazy, right? 
but here it's just making up stuff like that doesn't exist right i mean i don't know what you guys have seen but i've never seen that <laughs> um yeah and then we do i don't have a lot of time for that but we do a kind of experiment so here's restricting the noise like to be more local not affect the other regions um here we have experiments with you know, increasing the size of the heart. So, you know, like if you have <laughs> enough, uh, enough epsilon, you can really make it think the heart is a very big emoji, you know? <laughs> so, you know, like, yeah, if you show that to, uh, to MD, they, they will question a bit your <laughs> network, unless it's uh, MD in training, maybe. <laughs> But um, yeah, and for black box attacks, it, it doesn't work at all as well. So that's the interesting thing. It's much harder. Like you can make it mess up, but you see, like it's it's much more robust to this kind of thing. There are all sort of experiments um, to back this up. Uh, we don't have time, so just I'll just go through this quickly. Here's just resizing without changing the shape, and it's. Uh, resizing for different, you know, not just the heart, but also the clavicle here, like very small, normal, very big uh, for the lung, and also some numbers. But yeah, the conclusion of that is just over the whole presentation, not just this part, but always check network attention. It doesn't really cost you that much and can save you a lot of troubles. Also, convince MDs or anyone else who doesn't trust image level predictions. Um, if you have different attention methods, they can give different results. Some of them are contradictory. So, you don't know necessarily if that's just your model that's bad, or maybe it just could be that your, your attention method is bad, you know. So, we've seen some things to deal with that. Uh, you can use attention to handle small data set to weekly supervised detection, as I showed at the beginning, which is supervised segmentation of like these previous spaces and neck port regularization with attention consistency loss. And hide the key to your heart, the model's weight and architecture, because if someone has that, uh, they can design very powerful adversarial attacks and make you fail your PhD. <laughs> <laughs> And yes, thank you very much, everyone. I have uh, just the references here. So a lot of these works, like for example, Adversary Heart Attack, was done Kiara Bortsova, one of my colleagues in um, the Netherlands. And uh, this method with like attention consistency loss, was done with one of my students uh, at Stanford, uh, Ali Mirzazadeh. And uh, yeah, those are some other state-of-the-art papers. Uh, if you want to see more details, you can check all of those that are available on archive, free access. And if you want to ask me more questions, let's make it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Uh Let's see if there are questions.